Today, God's Word to us, um, and we're going to be looking at healthy prayer patterns. We're looking in the big picture at total fitness, what it means to be well and growing in health and in all dimensions of our life, and especially um, we're focusing for a while on spiritual fitness. And a vital part of spiritual fitness is prayer. If I had to ask a number of Christians, and sometimes even some of the more mature Christians, what is the most challenging and frustrating part of your life, some of them would answer prayer. They find it hard to pray. Many Christians find it hard to pray for more than a couple of minutes at a time. After a minute or two, the mind starts to wander. That's true in personal prayer. Sometimes it's true even in public prayer when we're in church together. I remember growing up, we had in our church service what we called the long prayer. <laughs> or others called it more uh, delicately the congregational prayer. And today still, you may say, oh, now it's time for the long prayer. And you settle in and, okay, that elder's going to pray a long, long time. And if you looked at your watch it might add up to five or ten minutes. You watch more than that amount of time in commercials in one hour of TV, but the long prayer goes on forever and ever while the commercials seem to go by in a blur. There's something about prayer that we do find hard, whether we're doing it personally or whether we're doing it together with others. We find that it is very hard to focus. And... So Christians can find that it's hard to pray for any length, to know what to pray about, and to just get really bored if the elder's long prayer goes on for more than a couple of minutes, and to get really bored and zoned out if you had to sit for 10 minutes and just pray. Why is that? Why is prayer so difficult, and how can we perhaps develop some patterns of prayer that can make our prayer life more healthy. We'll think about that some more. We live in a time when communication is almost constant, and there is a command in the Bible. It says to do something without ceasing. And so we whip out our cell phone and we Snapchat with somebody without ceasing and then we hop to Facebook to see if we've had any likes lately and then we zoom over to watch a few seconds of the latest viral video and we do certain things without ceasing. Um, the Bible says, what without ceasing? Pray without ceasing. And so again, we, we have to ask ourselves now, what is it about a, a healthy prayer life that could move us a little closer to prayer without ceasing, to find that when we have some time to pray, we actually pray during that time, and to find that, in fact, prayer becomes more and more just a natural part of our life, that our instinct is to turn our minds to God and to talk with Him, to praise Him, to thank Him, to ask Him for help in all kinds of circumstances, to indeed pray without ceasing. Let's listen to what our Lord Jesus Christ says, but also look at the model of our Lord Jesus in the Scriptures. Here are just a few statements from the Bible about Jesus' prayer life. He would withdraw to desolate places and pray. He went out to the mountain to pray, and all night he continued in prayer to God. During the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with loud cries and tears, and he was heard. Jesus was a man of prayer. He was constantly in communication with God, sometimes taking all night to pray to the Lord. He's our model. He's also our instructor and teacher. And we who struggle with prayer need to say the same things that the disciples once said when they found Jesus praying. They said to him, Lord Teach us to pray. And that's our prayer today, that Lord, teach us to pray. Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by men. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. 
But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need even before you ask Him. This then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For if you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. That's part of Jesus' teaching on prayer taken from the Sermon on the Mount. When we think about prayer and healthy prayer patterns, sometimes questions come to mind. One question is, should I pray alone or pray with others? When you hear Jesus' words, it sounds like only prayer alone is what you should do. Go into your room, shut the door. Should I pray alone or is it okay to pray with others? Should I pray on the spot when something comes to mind, I've got an urgent request and I pray, or should I have a schedule where I have certain set times where I go to pray? Should I pray from my heart as I'm moved to pray? Or should I pray with a guide, have maybe written prayers or a, an outline that guides me in prayer? The very short answer to these prayer questions is yes. Because, in fact, all of the above is the correct answer, in a sense, when you're asking about healthy prayer patterns. Should I pray alone or with others? Well, pray alone and pray with others. Pray on the spot and pray on schedule. Pray from your heart and pray with a guide. All of these are proper and healthy patterns for prayer. So let's look at those things a little bit more. We know that praying alone is very important. It was true of Jesus in his own prayer life. He went up on the mountain by himself to pray. He would often pray in desolate places, says the Bible. He wanted to be alone with his Father. And he taught us to really focus on our Father. And it is true that if you never pray alone, then it's very likely that your public prayer life is phony that you're doing it with other people in mind. So he says, when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen, and then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Pray alone, because you have a personal relationship with God who cares about you as an individual, and one of the dangers of prayer, if you happen to be among religious people, is that you will start more and more to pray to impress others. That prayer becomes a show. And one of the deadliest things of any sort of prayer is when you're doing it to show off, when you're no longer in touch with who God is and focused on Him, and you're no longer in touch with who you are. Because you're so busy performing that you're never just you, yourself, all by yourself, with God. And so it is absolutely vital that we pray personally, individually, and alone. But that does not mean that it is wrong to pray together with others. When you're together in a prayer group or Bible study, when you get together in a church, if an elder were to lead in prayer and be thinking only, now how well am I impressing the people, then he would need to work on that dimension of his prayer life a lot and maybe just pull back from praying publicly until he had a more real personal prayer life again, but it is appropriate to pray with others. What did God say of his temple? The temple will be called a house of prayer for all nations. The places of public gathering are houses of what? Of prayer. They're places to get together to pray. Jesus himself had as his pattern of life every Sabbath to go into the synagogue. That was his custom. The Bible says the same of the Apostle Paul. He would go to the public place of worship, the synagogue, as was his custom. 
when God's people were facing some persecution and opposition, it says they raised their voices together in prayer to God. When Peter was locked in jail, awaiting execution, the church gathered and together prayed for him. And I could give countless examples. So praying with others, joining with others who love the Lord, joining with others who need the Lord and are together seeking help from him, it is appropriate and fitting to pray together as long as you realize the danger. As soon as you're starting to think more and more of what those others think of your prayer, then it's time to just pray quietly while you're in the group. Um, if you're one who's calling uh, like mine is or like an elder's might be to pray in front of other people, we must still always remember that we're praying on behalf of those people and speaking their prayers to the Lord. And we're talking to God, first of all, and not trying to impress them. In Jesus' words, he, he just urges us to focus on your unseen Father when you pray. And that will take care of a lot of the dangers that are inherent in praying with others with a desire to show off. Should we pray on the spot or pray more on a scheduled basis? Well, certainly we can pray on the spot. And by that I mean any time you face something and you need to pray in a hurry, pray. When Abraham's servant was sent out to find a wife for Isaac, this is an assignment that many of you would not envy and probably should not perform. You know, find your best hired man, send him out to get a wife for your kid. Uh, that probably won't work great in our particular setting, but that was the assignment that Abraham's servant had, and so it drove him to pray. He was getting near the area where he was supposed to find a wife, and he said, Lord, please give me success today. Show me the girl that you've chosen. And that's certainly an appropriate prayer for those of you who are perhaps considering romance. Lord, help, help me to find the right person if that's your will that I be married. When the people of Israel sinned against God and poisonous snakes were biting them, what happened? Moses prayed for the people. He wasn't praying on schedule. He didn't say, oh, um, yeah, it's about that time again. I think I'll offer a prayer. It's, these people are being bitten and they're dying of snake bite. I got to pray and I got to pray now. Samson was in chains and with his eyes gouged out after really blowing it and hanging out with Philistine women. And he was being mocked by the Philistines. So while he was in the temple of their gods, he prayed Oh God, please strengthen me just once more. And God answered, and he was strengthened just that one more time, and he brought down more of the enemies of God in that one day than he had throughout all of the mighty deeds of his life put together. Hannah was desperate for a child, and it was a terrible thing to be without a child for her and for so many other women, and she wept much and she prayed because of that. Nehemiah was a cupbearer to the king. It was heavy on his heart that Jerusalem was in ruins while he was off in another part of the Persian Empire as a cupbearer for the king. And he wanted to be able to do something about it. The king noticed that he was looking down. And you say, well, that's no big deal. I look down sometimes too. When you look down in the presence of a Persian king, you can get your head chopped off. So the king says, um, what is it you want? Uh, and then I prayed to the God of heaven. Uh, so the, Nehemiah just right on the spot prayed to the God of heaven and then told the king what was on his heart. And God granted Nehemiah's request and, and helped him to rebuild Jerusalem. And there are many other situations. I don't need to give you more examples to show you just the tremendous value of whenever you're in a pickle, pray to the Lord. Pray on the spot. When something great happens, praise the Lord right on the spot. Don't say, well, usually I pray in the morning after I get out of bed or, you know, I pray before I go to bed at, or I pray at meal times. So it's not, it's not that time yet. I think I'll wait to praise the Lord until I get to the scheduled spot. No, if, if something good and blessed happens, just praise God right on the spot. Thank Him. So whether it's in praise and thanks right on the spot or whether it's an urgent need right on the spot, or whether it's a difficult person right on the spot. You don't have to wait for the Lord's Prayer to recite, forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. You might need to pray right on the spot, oh Lord, help me to not blow my lid. Um, help me 
to deal with this person calmly, to forgive the offense that I'm sensing here as you have forgiven me. So pray on the spot by all means. But at the same time, that does not eliminate the value of praying on schedule. It's good to praise the Lord, to proclaim your love in the morning and your faithfulness at night. Daniel, that great man of prayer, the man who would rather face hungry lions than give up prayer, had a regular prayer schedule. Three times a day, Daniel got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to his God just as he had done before. He was a person who prayed sometimes on the spot, but he had his regular times of prayer. And I've mentioned before that um, this could almost be compared to coaching. When you're dealing with a basketball team or some other sort of team, you have your scheduled times to talk to the team, and you have your moments where, hurry up, get down the court, he's over there. You know, or why did you stand there? Why didn't you grab the rebound? You're offering correction or advice while the game is going on, but there's also the locker room before the game. There's a break at, every, at the end of every period where everybody comes to catch their breath again and to get a little bit of advice from the coach before they run back out there. And our prayer times can be a little that way too, where we need to interact with God on the spot as life is going along, but we also need those breaks to take a break and spend some time talking to him about the situation and listening to him about what he wants for us. So have a schedule. I, I firmly believe that your prayer life will suffer if you don't have scheduled prayer times in your life. And it might not be the same time for everybody. For some, uh, first thing in the morning is excellent because it gets your day off to the right start. You pray to the Lord, you spend some time in Scripture before you do anything else. And so for a great many people, that's the best time to have a, a firmly scheduled prayer time. For many of us, of course, for family devotions, I think meal times work out very well for that. Um, and again, bedtime when the day is wrapping up is an excellent time as well. But whatever your schedule is, have one. Have a scheduled time, and you'll find that if you're praying and listening to God during the scheduled times, then you're more likely to also be in tune with Him during the unscheduled times, where you can just pray on the spot and seek His help or praise Him, and your prayer life will be blessed in that. So again, you can compare it to coaching or whatever other picture you want, but the need of the scheduled time and of those spontaneous right-on-the-spot times, both are valuable in a healthy prayer life. Praying from your heart or praying according to a pattern. Again, both are helpful. All prayer, if it's real prayer, should come from the heart and not just be something that trips across our lips. But that doesn't mean that every prayer you ever offer has to be one of the deepest, most powerful emotions surging up within you. Many prayers may be that, but think of it realistically in human conversation. Sometimes you speak to somebody with deep, deep feeling. Other times, you know, you're just talking and then you're getting on with what's going on. And that's okay too. But prayer from the heart is really expressing ourselves. I've been pouring out my soul before the Lord. That's what Hannah said. She wasn't just talking or requesting of this or that. She was pouring out her soul. Psalm 62, verse 8, Trust in Him at all times, O people. Pour out your heart before Him, for God is a refuge for us. You pour out your heart and take refuge in God. And sometimes your heart is just glad and when your heart is glad, your tongue rejoices. Prayer is an expression of the gladness of the heart. And then that um, is voiced by your tongue. But, but your heart, you're moved to pray. And yet, as, you, as you're moved to pray, as your heart is engaged, as the Holy Spirit is stirring in your heart and your soul to pray, that does not eliminate the value of prayer patterns and of having... Uh, a form almost for prayer. You can pray with a guide. In fact, I would suggest that sometimes having a guide for prayer can help you. Can help you not find the long prayer to be a drag. 
can help you not to run out of things to say after 30 seconds have gone by. To have a pattern to help you in your prayer, not just when your heart is being really, really stirred. Sometimes a healthy pattern will help the heart to be stirred. And so I want to just describe four guides for prayer, four patterns that you can experiment with in your prayer life. And that's okay too. You may say, oh man, that sounds weird. Experiment with prayer? Well, try something. You know, um, it, it's all right to try something. And the first thing to try is the Lord's Prayer, the one Jesus taught us. And then there's an acronym, A-C-T-S, that we'll look at. Pray the Bible is a great pattern for prayer that we want to think about in a little more detail. And pray like children is, is another pattern. And these are not mutually exclusive. There's a lot of overlap between them. But my suggestion is that you know what these patterns are and then try them. Find a pattern that really helps you in your prayer life. The Lord's Prayer. And when I say pray the Lord's Prayer, one thing that can mean is simply saying the Lord's Prayer. Just say it that way and, and mean it, and that's a great prayer. But I don't think that it's meant just as a prayer to recite, to memorize and then recite. It has great value in that. But it's given not just as words to recite, and certainly not as words to get brownie points with God. You have sinned, here is your penance, say, 12 Our Fathers. Well, you know, that's sometimes the way the Lord's Prayer has been used. The Lord's Prayer can itself be a form of what Jesus called vain repetition, like the pagans, who think that if you rattle off 12 Our Fathers, it makes a lot of things better. No, that's just praying like a pagan. But to have the Lord's Prayer as a prayer that you speak and really mean is valuable. And to have the Lord's Prayer as an outline, a structure for prayer, is what I'm talking about now. So, our Father is how it starts. And you just pause there and say, Thank you, God, that you are my Father. That you've chosen not just to be my judge or my punisher, or even just my owner, but that I am your child, and that you love me, and that you care for me, and that you number every hair on my head, and you can go on and on with what it means to you that God is your Father, and why you are so glad that He loves you. And you can say how much you love Him as your Father. That's why Jesus came, is to make us children of God. So pray like it. Spend some time with our Father and remember, of course, that He's in heaven, that He's great, that He's splendid, that He's magnificent, that He's far greater than we are, and yet He's chosen to be close to us as our Father. And so spend a little time with Him as, as, the, as the Father who loves you with an everlasting love. And then hallowed be thy name. Praise Him. What is there to praise Him for? Look around at the creation and things that he has made that have caught your attention that day. Praise him because of who he is. Think about who he is. Think about his holiness. Think about his power. Think about his justice and praise him that he is the just God. That people do not get away with murder, but that he's just. Praise him that he's merciful. That those who turn to him in sorrow and repentance are forgiven. And praise Him for so many other things that are true of God. You see what I mean? The, the Lord's Prayer is not hurrying through, hallowed be thy name, but praising God for who He is and for the wonderful things that He's done. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Sometimes the news will make you pray that. You see some terrible crime or tragedy or sorrow and you say, oh, I wish God's kingdom were here in all of its fullness. I wish things were the way they are supposed to be. Lord, hurry. Make your kingdom come to earth as it already perfectly rules in heaven. Or you look at the many, many people who are lost without Christ, lost in their sins, on the road to perishing. And you pray, Lord, please save them. Please use your ambassadors and missionaries. Use me to help your kingdom to come. Use me to this week in my work or the way I treat others that just a little slice of God's kingdom 
will appear in the way I behave. And, and you'll have to fill in the details because then you get more specific. Lord, reign in how I treat my children this week. Lord, rule and accomplish your purposes in the way I do my job. Help me with those people I'm going to meet this week and may God's kingdom reign in the way those relationships go. And that helps us then. It's okay to pray about our daily needs. Sometimes that's why we pray only very briefly and when we run out of stuff to say is, okay, here's, here's my wish list. Here's the stuff I wanted. Sometimes it's pretty much the stuff I prayed about last week and two months ago. Well, that's okay. Sometimes we have the same needs recurring and so we can pray about them again and again, but we can get stuck on our daily bread. We can get stuck on the gimme, gimme, gimme prayers and just the stuff we happen to want in our own little world. Once you've prayed to God as your Father who's in heaven, you're praising His name and you're seeking His kingdom, hey, it's also okay to bring to Him the daily bread needs, the, the stuff of everyday life that you want His help with. Lord, um, the bills are coming in a little faster than the income. Could I have some help with that? Lord, I'm having a hard time just having enough energy and time for each day. Help me with that. Uh, praying for just the daily needs. So praying for our daily bread. And then there's the relational part of prayer. Forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. That's not just rattling off those words and moving on. That's praying while taking inventory. Lord, forgive my debts and let's see, what are they? What have I been up to lately that needs forgiving? And you're not going to know it all. I guarantee you, you're better at sinning than you are at knowing it. So you're never going to have a perfect confession where you list every sin that you just committed because you, you do sins you don't even know. And even the good stuff we do often has bad motives or something tangled with it. But, but you pray anyway. And you say, Lord, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. What is poisoning my relationship with you? Please forgive it and remove it. What is poisoning my relationship with others? Lord, I forgive it. Lord, help me if I can't forgive it to have your strength to release it, to let it go into your hands, to let vengeance be yours. And so think about the people in your life that you're ticked off at or who might be ticked off at you because Jesus also has words about that. If somebody has something against you, then go and try to make it right. But this part of the prayer is dealing with relationships under the umbrella of grace. I want God to deal with me graciously, and I want to deal with others graciously. And then there's spiritual warfare prayer. Lord, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. What's your temptation? Some of you know very well what your two or three or one worst and most chronic temptations are. Maybe for some, it's alcohol. Maybe for some, it's pornography. Maybe for some, it's your temper. Maybe for some, it's chronic worry, worry, worry without trust. For others, it may be something else. But what is that thing that you find so hard to deal with? Ask the Lord to just not bring you into temptation you can't handle and to help you fight against the evil one. Because when you pray, you got, you're doing it in the presence of God's enemies and your enemies. And so you're praying, God, deliver me from evil. Prayer is, is basically radioing heaven for help when you're in the middle of a war. So that's the part of the prayer where you're really calling on the Lord for help in the conflict. You see what I mean about using the Lord's Prayer as a pattern and an outline for prayer and not just words that we recite together. And please, next time we recite the Lord's Prayer together in a worship service, don't somebody hop up and say, we're not supposed to do that. No, you can recite the Lord's Prayer and say the Lord's Prayer just as it is with much blessing and benefit, but it also is of tremendous benefit as a guide for prayer. And in particular, it's helpful as a guide to get you beyond the daily bread request. Not to get rid of the daily bread request, but to go beyond it, seeking God's kingdom, God's glory help in the relationships and the forgiving that's needed, battling the evil one and all of his forces. So the Lord's Prayer is Jesus' answer to the disciples' question, Lord, teach us to pray. He gave us a pattern. And if you follow this pattern, and if you follow it pretty thoroughly, you will find yourself sometimes praying a lot more than one or two minutes because many things 
that the Lord wants you to pray about will come to mind as you go through the outline of the Lord's Prayer. Another simple outline that's been helpful to many people, which covers a lot of the same things as the Lord's Prayer, would be this acronym, A-C-T-S, ACTS. Adoration, confession, thanksgiving, supplication. Adoration is praising God, adoring Him, telling Him how great He is. It's kind of the equivalent of, hallowed be thy name, and giving God praise. Confession, well, that's admitting what you've done wrong and asking His forgiveness, very similar to forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Thanksgiving, you know what that is. But don't just know what it is. <laughs> Give thanks in all circumstances. And when you pray, um, when you're praying in your set times of prayer especially, remember not just to offer requests, but also thanksgiving. And then supplication is offering requests. It's offering requests for a variety of things. And it may be, thy kingdom come. Help the missionaries. Help my neighbor, whom I'm hoping will come to Christ. So supplication may be very kingdom-oriented. Supplication may also include, of course, give this day our daily bread and the stuff that we need. But this helps. Just to have those four words in mind will help your prayer life to be healthier because it will help you to have a, a richer, fuller sense of praising God, of admitting your sins, of giving thanks. And supplication is put last in this one because, well, we tend to put it first. We tend to go straight to the asking and to skip over and fast forward past the adoration, the confession, and the thanksgiving. I say we, um, I probably should just say me. Maybe all of you are so noble that you don't bother asking anything until you've been praising for half hour and then giving thanks for another half hour. But maybe one or two of you are a little like me. Supplication, just a little more detail. It may just, it's just the needs of the moment. Uh, this is a big bulk of what a lot of us pray about, praying for family members, various needs that they have, whether one of them is struggling in school or got an injury or an illness or something they're down about or a chronic issue, whatever that may be. I know that for us, um, in our family's devotion time together, we kind of wanted our supplication to cover just a little bit more than this week's ball games or who's sick or who's got a test. And so um, we would, for every prayer time, we pray for at least one church member or family, for somebody on our street that we know, and for one of our missionaries. By the way, that's why we have a mission of the month, partly for the sake of giving offerings to that particular thing, but partly to keep in your mind one particular missionary for that month. And then after you've done that for a year or two, don't they start kind of sticking in your mind? You know who they are. And then pray for all of them, uh, you know, and pray for them with frequency. So, again, part of this is patterning your prayer life. If it doesn't come naturally to you to pray for your fellow church members, whip out your church directory and pick out a different person or family every day and pray for them. Look at who lives on your street and pray for one today, another one tomorrow. Think about your missionaries and pray for different ones at different times. See, that's the value. Some people say, oh, to have a pattern for prayer, that would, I mean, that's so unspontaneous. It's so unheartfelt. Hey, your heart needs help. Your heart doesn't naturally go to the missionaries. You're too busy on Snapchat. So schedule the missionaries into your prayer until, it's, until the sights has come to your head. You know, when you're just going around, oh yeah, they're, they're there in Uganda. I, I'm going to offer up a quick prayer for them. So once you have certain kinds of prayers built into your life pattern, then the spontaneous prayers are going to be broader and more concerned with the things of God's kingdom. Another uh, pattern for prayer, and one that is extremely valuable and important, is to pray the Bible. And praying the Bible begins with praying the Psalms. Uh, there's a tiny little book, but nonetheless a helpful one by Don Whitney. It's just called Praying the Bible. And some of you may find that one helpful. But the suggestion when we talk about praying the Psalms is you go through as much Psalm as you can get through in as much time as you have. So you say, oh, my prayer time today is going to be five minutes. And maybe you go through two Psalms or three in that time. Or maybe you get stuck on one phrase and that just gets you praying. And all of a sudden your time's up. You don't say, oh, rats, I didn't get through as far as I wanted to. Your Psalm was a help to your prayer. Take Psalm 23, the psalm of the day. The Lord is my shepherd. 
And depending on how well you know your Bible, that may trigger all kinds of things. The, Jesus said, I'm the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Oh, Lord Jesus, thank you for laying your life down for me. He carries the lambs in his arms and carries them close to his heart, Isaiah 40. Yeah, sometimes your prayers are going to be triggered by knowledge of the Bible. Other times you say, well, I don't know Isaiah 40, and I don't have John 10 memorized. Um, but the Lord is my shepherd. I know that one. And I know that shepherds look out, you know, they, they help, and I'm just so thankful that God is watching out for me. And you start thinking about that, and you pray to God, and you say, thank you, Lord, that you are my shepherd. And whatever comes to your mind, and then you say, well, I shall not want. Um, boy, you've taken good care of me. It's been a long time since I went without a meal. It's been a long time since I never had a place to sleep. And I have to even admit that 99% of my worries don't seem to come true. I do them anyway, but you seem to take care of a lot of them. And, and so you can pray, and, and with each phrase of, of a psalm, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. And you can think about the ways in which he's brought you into bounty and his goodness. He restores my soul. If you get to the part about enemies, then you start thinking about what are the, what are the things that are destroying my life or been hurting me? And he's going to look out for those too. And you pray to him about that. And, and so you can pray different um, aspects of a psalm. And sometimes you'll race through one. Sometimes you'll, you'll be praying longer than you ever thought over a couple of sentences that trigger something in you. And this is not Bible study, where you're trying to get the exact, correct interpretation of a psalm. That's important to do, but not necessarily during your prayer time. During your prayer time, it can be a little like conversation. You know how conversation is? You start chatting with somebody, and all of a sudden something comes to mind. And you start yakking about that. Um, and they don't say, well, they might, <laughs> but uh, they won't always say, but we were talking about this. You know, how'd you get off on that tangent? You know, sometimes conversations are pretty spontaneous and free-flowing, and you're talking about one thing, and all of a sudden it zooms in a different direction because it came to mind while you were talking about something else. And prayer can be like that. You're praying to God. You're praying in a psalm, and something comes to mind. And so you talk to God about that, whether that came out of the psalm or not. That's okay because it's meant to be more of a free-flowing conversation. The psalms are also extremely helpful because some of those psalms are going to invite you to pray prayers you thought you couldn't. Like, Lord, break their teeth, smash their jaw, take them down, wreck them. And you say, boy, I'm not sure I've got... And, I, and I'm not saying if there's nobody that you want smashed today that you should just try to figure somebody out and smash them anyway, because today is my smashing prayer day. <laughs> you know, I, I, that's the title of a sermon, Smashing Prayers. But anyway, the British mean something different by that. A smashing good prayer. Um, but those smashing prayers are no laughing matter in the Bible. And, and the fact is, there's prayers like that. Or you get to Psalm 88. Lord, everything's bad. The darkness is my closest friend. End of prayer. Well, sometimes that... We aren't honest enough to pray to God like that until God drops that prayer in our lap. Um, and you can pray Psalm 88 and say, Lord, it's bad. I'm down. I mean, there's a lot of people who go through periods of depression. Psalm 88 is the best prayer you could find. It won't lift you out of it, but it will at least say, hey, you can pray when you're depressed too. Even if you've got nothing good to say to God, just pray. Anyway, uh, the, the Psalms give a voice to every emotion in, in hu the human heart. They give a voice to stuff that we're not able to be honest about. So pray the Bible, especially the Psalms. And I would just urge you to make a part of your prayer life. Just take a Psalm every day. Pray through it. Maybe pray through a couple if you say, hey, uh, I got done with that one in 30 seconds and no great prayer came to mind. Well, go into the next one. Because they, that is God's prayer book for us. Pray some of Paul's prayers and other prayers that you find in the epistles. I love the prayers in Ephesians 1 and 3 uh, because they, they put into words things that we'd hardly think of or dare to pray for ourselves. I keep asking that the glorious Father would give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you'd know Him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart would be opened. And so this prayer that God would open the eyes of our heart to show us the riches of our inheritance that's all there in Ephesians 1. Or you go to Ephesians 3. I kneel before the Father, 
from whom his whole family in heaven and on earth derives its name, I pray that out of his glorious riches he would strengthen you with power through his Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ would dwell in your heart through faith. And that you, being rooted and established in love, would have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. You pray that for yourself because you know that the inspired writer of the Bible was praying that for his readers. So you take that prayer and you say to God, I want to know that love that goes beyond knowledge. I want to know your power that does immeasurably more than all I dare to ask or imagine. And you take those prayers of the Bible and you pray them. Or you read the book of Revelation and you say, you know, worthy are you our Lord and God to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength for you created all things and by your will they were created and have your being. And you praise him for that, but you know that when you're praising him, that's the praise of the angels and the archangels and the seraphim and the perfect saints of heaven. And there's something about praying with them and you say, whoa, um, Lord, I praise you, or worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And you bless the name of Jesus Christ with all the saints of heaven. So you're echoing the prayers of heaven as you're praying with the Bible. And sometimes you pray with the Bible even when the, what you're reading from the Bible is not a prayer. You read a parable of Jesus. Let's say it's the parable of the prodigal son. And you may see in yourself that son who has gone far away, or you may see yourself as that grumpy older brother who thinks he's so good when he's not. But, but what you see above all is this waiting father who loves you and rushes out to meet you and greet you. And so you pray to him in response to that. Or you read the story of God's great rescue and deliverance. So as you read your Bible, you pray. It's not that these are two separate things. That first I read my Bible, okay, that's done. Slam the cover, and now I head over here. Now it's my prayer time. Let's see, what shall I talk to God about? Well, what about combining those two? And especially, it's in meditation on the Bible, not just reading it, but pondering and meditating and thinking about it. And after a while, you won't be able to tell the difference between meditation and prayer because they become the same thing. As you meditate on God's word, you're talking to God about what you're reading. So pray the Bible. And you'll find that it's not um, always one and a half minutes and I'm out of things to talk about. If you've not, got nothing to talk about, then shut up and listen. <laughs> you know, read a while and see what comes to mind. And when you hear what he's talking about, then you may have things that you want to talk to him about again. But pray the Bible. And... Then another thing that I recommend sometimes is just pray like children, because that, again, kind of like the Psalms, gives you a range of prayer. Our Father in Heaven, or just Daddy, you know, is a, is a great way to talk to God. The, the things that a little kid will say, wow, awesome! And, and so you praise God for how great and majestic He is. I'm sorry. You know, forgive us our debts. Again, the, there's overlap between these, but these are different patterns that you can look at. Um, I pick up why it's not fair from the Psalms. Um, over and over and over, there is, why, O oh Lord, how long, O oh Lord, when are you going to do something about this, O oh Lord? You think you could wake up now and get going? Uh, you, know, you find sometimes even very impolite, kind of the way, you know, sometimes you can be an enemy of somebody and you're really obnoxious, but sometimes you're just a kid who doesn't understand things very well, and so you just wish mom, you don't understand what mom and dad are up to, but you'll raise the roof. Um, wah! Uh, you know, when you're really little, or when you're a little bigger than that, you'll gripe to mom and dad, and you get to prayer and say, well, I shouldn't do that in prayer. Well, maybe you shouldn't, but if that's how you feel, then you might as well, because he knows that's the trouble with prayer. Pretending doesn't work, okay? Pretending to impress others doesn't work, but when you go to God, you are not trying to impress the judge of a speech contest. That's why you don't rattle off all the phrases like pagans. He knows what you need even before you ask him. He knows if you're grumpy even before you tell him. He knows if you're ticked off at him before you tell him. And it may not be okay to be angry at him. Maybe sometimes it may even be okay to be impatient a little bit with him because the world isn't the way he wants it to be yet. And he wants you to be kind of impatient with it. But however that may be, whether it's right or not, it is. 
That's who you are right now. And when you're praying, you've got to be who you are, not who you aren't. And so if you're wondering why and it's not fair, say so. And then please, you know, to, to offer your supplications, your requests. When God grants requests, say thank you. Don't be like those who ask a lot and never say thanks. You know the old saying, hey, if God took away everything you never asked him for, what would you have left? Yikes, you know, that's one of those questions I don't like to ask too often, but he doesn't always operate that way, uh, fortunately for us, but let, let's nonetheless say thanks for all of his blessings, and then just prayers that aren't necessarily complimenting God or asking anything, but just expressing love, or just being quiet together. Sometimes when you enjoy somebody or you like them, you can be in the same place and you don't have to say anything, but you're still there. Um, you know, I can ride along in a car, and if, if it's a stranger, I kind of feel like I have to break the silence every so often and keep on talking. If it's just kind of a casual acquaintance, it's very uncomfortable to sit together with someone you don't know very well over long periods of time. If I'm with my wife or one of my kids or a good friend, I don't feel any pressure to talk or for them to talk. We just ride along if there's nothing to say. Um, and it's okay, because sometimes when you go off with God by yourself, you may not even have a whole lot to say. But you don't have to feel terribly guilty about that. Just be there with Him anyway. Enjoy His presence. If something comes to you, say it. If it doesn't, that's okay too. But these are patterns or um, almost, if you will, methods, guides for prayer. The Lord's Prayer supremely. The ACTS acronym. Pray the Bible. Pray like children. Um, Keep track of what these patterns are. Try a couple of them and see what happens in your life. Because sometimes when you're struggling in your prayer life, you can say, well, what's wrong with me? I'm... And you can get really down on yourself, which doesn't help your prayer life a whole lot, actually. Um, and sometimes you do... There isn't anything terribly wrong with you. You have the Holy Spirit who makes you want to pray, but you haven't yet developed a healthy pattern for prayer or a method for prayer that helps you to express the full range of expression to God. So try these and, and see what happens in your prayer life. Pray alone, pray with others, pray on the spot, pray on a schedule, pray from the heart, pray with a guide. And know that the one you're praying to is more eager to hear from you than you are to talk to him. We thank you, Father, that you invite us to pray and that you teach us to pray. And we pray, Lord, that the Holy Spirit will be our supreme teacher, bringing again the words and pattern of Jesus to our lives, connecting us with you, stirring in us a great desire in our hearts to pray, but also, Lord, equipping us to develop healthy prayer patterns that we can communicate more and more freely with you, and that as we pray to you and pour out our hearts to you, we'll find our hearts being changed, becoming more in tune with you, our loving Father. Now hear us, Lord, together as we pray the prayer that you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. <laughs>